It's a great honor to be included in this year's Talent U12. Uh, really appreciate the recognition and the opportunity to share my research. Uh, so first, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been interested in chemistry, especially chemistry of the living systems since high school. And I started my journey in chemistry uh, as an undergraduate student at Peking University in China, um, where I did research in the molecular design lab working on uh, protein misfolding. Um, and after that, I moved to the US for doing research in mechanistic biochemistry, first at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with Professor Eric Cofield for my PhD, and then uh, at MIT with Professor Steve Lippert for a postdoc training. Um, and after that, I continued my research in this area, but under the context of small molecule drug discovery, and joined Janssen in 2015. And earlier last year, I joined uh, Scorpion Therapeutics, and we're a biotech company founded in 2020 in, in Boston. Um, so the theme of my research since I joined the pharmaceutical industry has been addressing challenges in small molecule drug discovery with biochemistry. And today I'd like to share with you two, uh, two uh, short stories from my research. And I would like to start with one of the projects that I did at Janssen uh, on kinase inhibitor drug discovery. Um, specifically, we found a way to find more selective kinase inhibitors by targeting the inactive form of kinases. Uh, so what are kinases? Um, Professor Ben Herringer just talked about molecular switches and uh, Kinases are actually a type of bi uh, biological molecular switches. They can be turned on and off by multiple mechanisms like phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, or protein-protein interactions, cellular localizations. And they control cell signaling by phosphorylation of the substrates. And de deregulation of kinases leads to various diseases. Uh, so they are great targets for drug discovery. Um, but one of the biggest challenges in kinase inhibitor drug discovery is the selectivity. Um, how do you find selective kinase inhibitors that inhibit only the target of interest without hitting other kinases? This is challenging because there are over 500 kinases enco encoded in the human genome. And, and essentially all active kinases share a highly conserved kinase, uh, kinase domain structure because they all need to bind to the same substrate, ATP, and catalyze the same type of reaction. So screening small molecule libraries uh, against the active kinase, which is relatively easy to do, use mostly non-selective inhibitors that binds to the um, binds to the highly conserved ATP binding pocket. Targeting inactive kinases instead actually offers better opportunities for finding selective kinase inhibitors, and this is because inactive kinases don't have the catalytic constraints, and each of them can be inactive in in a different way. So therefore, they represent more unique targets. So how do we find inhibitors targeting the inactive form of kinases? At Janssen, we try to address this challenge by developing a type of assay called cascade assay. And basically, we test compounds during kinase activation using recombinant kinases on assay plates. So we start the assay with kinase in the inactive form. And we activate the kinase during the assay. And once activated, then the, uh, the kinase can catalyze substrate phosphorylation which can be the assay readout. So to test small molecule compounds, we add the compounds during the kinase activation reaction. And if a compound preferentially binds to the inactive form, uh, it will stabilize the in inactive kinase and block activation, and therefore you don't detect any kinase activity. And the compound will show up as an inhibitor in the assay. You could also find compounds that preferentially inhibit the active form or compound that binds to both active and inactive form. So uh, testing compounds using cascade assay can find inhibitors of many different mode of inhibition, including ones that preferentially inhibit the inactive form. So how do we set up effective kinase cascade assay? Um, it wasn't clear when we started uh, because the kinase, uh, because kinase cascade assay uh, exhibit complicated kinetics because uh, we're dealing with two changing populations of the kinase, the inactive form and active form. And they can have very different compound binding affinities and catalytic properties. So the assay results are going to be time dependent. So to get a better understanding uh, of how it, how it behaves and uh, provides the radical framework for assay development, uh, I did some mathematical modeling considering the kinetics of kinase activation, uh, inhibitor and substrate binding, and kinase reactions. And indeed, the uh, mathematical modeling and simulations uh, reveal some of the unique properties of kinase cascade assay. Here I show one example. 
assume, uh, assuming we're testing an allosteric inhibitor that binds 100 times tighter to the inactive kinase, and the activation is achieved by adding an upstream kinase. So the simulation shows that the IC50 value or, or the concentration required for inhibiting 50% of the kinase uh, activity would increase over time. So in, another, uh, in other words, the compound would appear to be less potent over time in this type of assay. You also notice that the, the, how, how fast the IC50 value increase is dependent on how fast the kinase is activated. And we're able to confirm the simulation results experimentally using this BRAF MAC1 cascade. So this is a, this is a great example showing that um, we need to have the right activation kinetics and assay endpoint for, for any effective kinase cascade assay. Otherwise, even if you have very potent inhibitor that binds to the inactive kinase, it will appear as a very weak uh, compound, or even you don't see any inhibition in the, in the assay if the assay condition is not right. So when you have all the assay conditions correct, cascade assay can identify inactive form selecting inhibitors that cannot be found by the active kinase assay. And here's a great example. Well, we screened over 700,000 compounds for this kinase called HPK1 by two, two types of assays, the active kinase assay and kinase cascade assay. And here, here I show the percent inhibition for each compound from, from the two assays, and each dot represents a unique compound. So from this plot, you can see that there's, uh, there's a large group of compounds that showed inhibition in both assays, and most of these are compounds that binds to the conserved ATP binding pocket. You probably also notice that there's a second smaller group of compounds that showed inhibition only in the kinase cascade assay. And these are compounds that preferentially inhibit the, uh, the inactive form of the kinase. So we validated compounds uh, from this second group of hits. And as this example shows, indeed, there, there's, um, there, there are inactive form selected compounds. So this compound binds to the inactive form 20 times tighter to, uh, than to the active form. And it's an allosteric inhibitor, meaning that it doesn't bind to the con uh, highly conserved ATP binding pocket. The binding pocket is actually outside of the kinase domain. And importantly, um, this, this primary hits from the screen has very promising kinome selectivity, inhibiting only four out of over 100 kinases. So this is a great example showing that um, by targeting the uh, inactive form of the kinase using cascade assay, you can find more selective kinase inhibitors. Um, so now I'm going to switch the topic and uh, talk a little bit more uh, about the work that I'm working on at Scorpion Therapeutics. Um, at Scorpion, we're developing the next generation of target cancer therapies, and we work on not only validating oncogene targets like kinases, uh, but also on undroppable targets, for example, transcription factors. And I will talk a little bit more about drug discovery for undroppable targets. So what are undroppable targets? Uh, KRAS is a great example. So KRAS is a frequently mutated oncogene. Uh, the mutation includes this glycine 12 to cysteine mutation. It was considered undroppable because there's not a, a good binding pocket for small molecule compound to engage. Um, and uh, Professor Shokas lab at UCSF and the pharmaceutical company Amgen first explored covalent inhibition of this target, taking advantage of this cysteine introduced by the mutation. So by covalently attach the small molecule compound to that cysteine, the compound would bind to a induced shallow pocket on the surface of the protein and inhibit the function of this protein. So despite this uh, great example, drug discovery for undroppable target is still largely an unexplored area. There's, uh, there are still many challenges, like how do you find ligandable cysteines and do, uh, how do you find cryptic pockets and, uh, and how do you find functional hits? So as Scorpion, we're trying to push this frontier uh, in drug discovery. So how, how do we do this? Uh, there are many important factors contributing to this. And uh, uh, here I show three of the uh, factors. So we have an in-house covalent compound library that can provide uh, desired, uh, kits with desired chemical physical properties. Um, we also have a mass spec based chemoproteomics platform uh, so that we can screen our compound in live cell or lysate. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but basically we can identify which compound binds to which cysteine on which protein in live cell or lysate. Uh, and the method was uh, initially pioneered by Professor Ben Corbett at Scripps. And as, uh, as, as Scorpion Therapeutics, we further improved the throughput and the accuracy. 
Once, once we get a hit, we want to know if the hit is functional. So we test them in the functional assay to see if they have uh, the desired uh, pharmacodynamic effect. So, uh, so when, when screening covalent compound library, we need to consider what are the best conditions um, that can maximize our chance of finding good covalent hits. So what are good covalent hits? Um, so we need to consider the general mechanism of covalent inhibition shown on the, on the left. So the covalent inhibitor would actually bind to the target protein um, non-covalently first, followed by the covalent bond formation characterized by the rate constant K and NACT. Um, so for desired hits, we will, we will like them to form covalent adduct, not just driven by warhead reactivity, but also by specific non-covalent binding interactions. The non-covalent binding interaction is, is critical because that gives the compound selectivity. Otherwise, the compound would just uh, react randomly with, with any system that can give you all kinds of off-target effect. So how do we find this type of hits in the screen? Um, again, there are many factors to consider, and here I focus the discussion on the incubation time, so how long you treat your, your sample, either live cell or lysate with the compound. So I calculate the percent covalent ADA formation at a specific cysteine uh, as a function of the non-covalent binding interaction characterized by Ki show on x-axis, as well as a function of K and act, the rate of forming covalent, covalent bonds. Uh, so each curve represents a unique K and act from low K and act at the bottom shown blue to high K and act shown red on top. Um, the, the area highlighted in blue uh, covers typical K and act of acrylamide, which contains several of the approved covalent drugs. So from this simulation, you can see if we just do one hour incubation, then for a compound with relatively slow k act or slower rate of forming covalent adduct, no matter how strong their non-covalent binding interaction is, they just don't, don't form enough covalent adduct to be, uh, for us to be confidently detecting the mass back based screen. And we need to increase the incubation time to form enough adduct. So after balancing uh, many other factors, we think that three-hour incubation is optimal. So screening the COVID library um, in live cell or lysate under the optimal condition, we're able to find functional hits for undroppable transcription factors. And here's one example. Um, so we're able to show that uh, tar uh, the engagement, COVID engagement at the target system by mass back based approach and in the middle panel, we show that the compound can inhibit the DNA binding function of this transcription factor. Um, and and uh, importantly, we show that the inhibition depends on that target cysteine. If we mutate that cysteine to serine or allyl, the compound no longer are able to bind, and you don't uh, there, you see a significant loss of inhibition. And finally, on the on the right, we show that a compound can inhibit the downstream gene expression. Um, so with, with our strategy, we're able to find functional hits uh, for several undroppable targets now. Um, so I'm going to stop here, and uh, uh, with that, I really want, and want to thank many people. Uh, and first, I, I would like to thank people who mentored me in the past, especially Professor Eric Holfield and Professor Steve Lippert, um, and Daniel Kroski and Kayon uh, at Janssen. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the, uh, the leadership team at, at, at Scorpion Therapeutics for their strong support. And I, I really want to thank all the colleagues, my previous colleague and, and current colleagues, uh, for their contribution, because uh, drug discovery is uh, is a really a teamwork. And here I show colleagues who contributed to the to the research program that I I just presented. Um, and and thank you for for your attention. Thanks, uh, chemical and uh, chemical and engineering news for the for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Weiju. Um, I'm going to start by asking, how long did your whole the whole process you described um, going from uh, hit to lead compound take? Yeah, it really de depends on, on, on the target. So, uh, if, if everything goes well, it can be a, as short as a year, but if it's, it's, if it's challenging, it can take multiple years. So um, it's, it's not easy. All right. We have a, a question from the audience from uh, Dake Chen, who asks, Amgen and Maradi's compounds are already entering the clinic. Uh, why do you continue to pursue a G12C covalent inhibitor? No, I, actually, we're we're not working on this target. Um, I'm just using it as a uh, as an example to show uh, what what are undroppable targets. Or we're, we're we're working on um, several other 
uh, targets that's, that has not been explored. Okay, thank you for yeah, clarifying still, that for us. Yeah, there are still so many undroppable targets to be explored. Is there one you think is particularly exciting? Um, uh, yeah, um, I, I probably can't disclose too much about my current work, but definitely there, there are. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.